Cavell's The Senses of Walden is a heroic book since it was the first to take Thoreau's words seriously as a challenge to philosophy. But it is a heroic book, especially in the sense that that expression has in Walden. The heroic books, even if printed in the character of your mother tongue, will always be in a language dead to degenerate times. And we must laboriously seek the meaning of each word and line, conjecturing a larger sense than common use permits, out of what wisdom and valor and generosity we have. For more than one reason, we are living at the edge of degenerate times. For more than one reason, we need to listen to the generosity and wisdom of those who know how to seek the meaning of words, sentences, portions of heroic books. The idea of this workshop is to explore the potentiality and flexibility of mother tongue to crack the ice in order to present some of Cavell's hurl insights about Thoreau in a sharper focus. And to accomplish that hard task, we have today the opportunity to listen here at the Unicinos Department of Philosophy under the gentle support of Instituto Humanitas, three serious readers of Cavell, Professors Jonathan Stecchio from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Stanley Bates from Middlebury College, and Kelly Dean Jolie from Auburn University. Well, welcome to Unicinos. It's a great pleasure to have all you here to restart this ongoing conversation with us. Professor Jonathan. Well, thank you, Eduardo. Uh, it's very good to be here. Um, I will, since I'm not speaking in my mother tongue, I will rely a little bit on my notes. I'm sorry about that, but I think it will work better. And the main passage I chose to, um, to comment is a passage that occurs uh, close to the end of the book, The Senses of Walden. And I will read it and then comment each sentence. The first is, uh, the writer of Walden is as preoccupied as the writer of Paradise Lost with the creation of a world by a word. And then the, it starts a parenthetical remark uh, that it, it will be the main focus of my comment. Cavell says, a word has meaning against the context of a sentence. A sentence has meaning against the context of a language. A language has meaning against the, con the context of a form of life. A form of life has meaning against the context of a world. And a world has meaning against the context of a word. Uh, I will repeat these sentences later, but uh, the passage is constructed as a kind of circle. We start with words having meaning in the context of sentences, sentences in the context of language, language in the context of a form of life, forms of life in the context of a world, and then a word, role, word in the context of a word. Um, so I'm interested in understanding this disconnection, these connections. Uh, and I will try to do this by um, making some, some comments comparing what Cavell has to say in The Claim of Reason, especially in, in the first part, about what he repeatedly calls uh, Wittgenstein's vision of language, Wittgenstein's conception about the workings of language that Cavell, of course, subscribes, and his, some aspects of his reading of Walden in the senses of Walden. I was also struck by another um, philosophical convergence between this passage and what I think it's later Heidegger's um, view about the relation between language and world, uh, which is encapsulated in his famous and mysterious sentence that language is the house of being. <laughs> but this, um, this would be 
I will just record it to myself for another occasion and we'll focus on, on the comparison between Cavell on Wittgenstein and Cavell on, on Walden. So uh, starting my comment, for someone who knows a little bit about the history of analytical philosophy, I think a natural way to start elucidating the passage is to think of it as a condensed recounting uh, of an important development in the philosophy of language initiated by Frege, then taken up by Wittgenstein, and with some other steps that I will try to, to present. Um, so the, the first sentence in the parenthetical remark, which is again a word, has a meaning against the context of a sentence, is basically a restatement of Frege's context principle. Uh, the idea that the sense or the meaning of a word cannot be uh, analyzed, cannot be explained in isolation, but it has to be uh, understood in the, con in the larger context of the sentence. This was in the Foundations of Mathematics. I won't talk about the details, of, but this is a very well-known uh, thesis. Uh, and it was very important to the development, development of the philosophy of language in the 20th century. And then um, Wittgenstein uh, took that principal context from Frege and already in his early work, already in the Tractatus, radicalized it, uh, took a step further. And I think this is what Cavell is uh, indicating in part in his second sentence, namely, a sentence has meaning against the context of a language. So Wittgenstein, the Tractatus, uh, presented a view according to which not only we have to follow Frege and look at the meaning of words inside the context of a sentence, but we should think about language as a system, a symbolic system, and sentences themselves in order to analyze them, to know uh, their meaning, we need to see them in, in this web of interconnected meanings in this symbolic system, this wider symbolic system. So that was the second step of um, enlarging the, the idea of looking at the, the, the larger context to understand the meaning. And then we have the third step, which is Cavell's third sentence, a language has meaning against the context of a form of life. And this, of course, is a way of expressing late Wittgenstein's uh, progress compared to the Tractatus, because he himself came to realize, say, when in the investigations, philosophical investigations, that the system of language that he called for sometimes a calculus is itself embedded in a set of practices that, and embedded in our interests and he called that our formats of life. This is another notion that could be analyzed further, but I will just stop here to, to, to continue in my, my analysis. So we start with Frege's principle of context, early Wittgenstein goes a step further, and Wittgenstein investigations a step further to the forms, forms of life. And then we get, I think this is very, well known. Things get more complicated, for me at least, from the fourth sentence, which is uh, a form of life has meaning against the context of a world. This, at, at first sight, at least for somebody who is not already um, convinced by Cavell's reading of Wittgenstein, doesn't sound vit very Wittgensteinian, I think. What, what does it mean to say that a form of life uh, has meaning against the context of a world. But here is the point where I think it's interesting to, uh, to look at some uh, passages in The Claim of Reason where Cavell talks about the, the conditions for someone, in, in particular a child, to become initiated in our forms of life. And Cavell presents this as a way of uh, becoming also initiated in our world, or inheriting our world. 
Uh, Cavell starts talking about this in chapter seven. It was before already, at least implicitly, but the main chapter is chapter seven. And he asks initially, uh, what are we teaching when we point to, say, a pumpkin in, the, in front of a child and say, this is a pumpkin? What are we teaching the child? Are we teaching the meaning of the word pumpkin or what a pumpkin is? And he says that he was surprised uh, in, in his early work to discover that when we are thinking about a master of language, an adult that already uh, is, is a competent user of language, we could say either, we could say both. We are both. Imagine someone who doesn't have pumpkins in his, you know, his uh, community, his uh, form, form of life, and doesn't have the word pumpkin. And then I point, point to a pumpkin for the first time and say, this is a pumpkin. I am at the same time teaching what a pumpkin is and what is the meaning of the word pumpkin. But, the, but what Cavell says about the child is that in that case is not fully true to say neither that we are teaching the meaning of a word nor that we are teaching what the thing is. Why is that? So this, this has to do with the conditions for uh, well, uh, for, for a su success, well, su bem sucedida. <laughs> Something like that, for, for an effective, ostensive definition. Wittgenstein talks about this in the philosophical investigations, in the blue book. The idea is basically that it isn't true. We, we can, there is a philosophical picture that uh, leads us to think that when, when I give a, uh, an ostensive definition, I point to something, say that this uh, cap, and say this is blue, it's as if I was just labeling a thing, as if I was using a word and connecting the word to the thing, and the child is listening to this, she can, he or she can just uh, get the meaning of the word by making this connection. This is kind of magical connection between the word and the thing. And Wittgenstein says that that's not the case for, for an ostensive definition to really work. Lots of other conditions have to be in place. Many background distinctions are already need to be made. The, ch the child, for example, or the, the person I'm teaching, has to be able to distinguish between the color, the shape, the number, to, to know that I'm talking about the color of the object. So there are many other moves involved in really teaching the meaning of a word to someone. And the child, at least in the in an initial stage, is not uh, able to, to make those moves. So that's the main reason why Cavell says it wouldn't be truly, uh, fully true to say that we are teaching the meaning, neither the, the, what the thing is. And he brings this example home in the Claim of Reason, talking about an occasion when, she, when he tried to teach the word kitty to, to his daughter. And basically, he pointed to a cat, I suppose, and said, ah, kitty, this is a kitty. And she started repeating that word, and he thought, well, she knows now what a kitty is, what kitty means. But then some days later, for his surprise, she uh, stroked a um, fur piece and said kitty. And he was disappointed at first. Oh, what, what now is she meaning by the word kitty? Does she mean fur, something soft, or doesn't she mean at all an object? Could be something like, oh, this is very good to, to, to stroke or something like that. Um, and he's, I, I'm just summarizing the example, but he, uh, from a case like this, he extracts the, f the following lesson. And I quote him. I have wanted to say kittens, what we call kittens, do not exist in her, in his daughter's world yet. She has not acquired the forms of life which contain them. Not merely, oh, sorry, uh, they do not exist 
in something like the way cities and mayors will not exist in her world until long after pumpkins and kittens do. Or like the way God or love or responsibility or beauty do not exist in our world. So this, I think, is the main connection that I, I would like to draw between this idea that initiation into a language is initiation into a form of life, and this is, in turn, initiation into a world. It, it is a way of acquiring or, or inheriting, uh, getting inside a world. This is expressed uh, in a more general way in a um, subsequent passage where Cavell says, in learning language, you learn not merely what the names of things are, but what a name is. Not, not merely what the word for father is, but what a father is, and so on. Um, instead of saying either that we tell beginners what words mean or, what, or that we teach them what objects are, I will say we initiate them into the relevant forms of life held in language and gathered ar around the objects and persons in our world. So this is the way I understand the fourth sentence in that passage that I quoted at the beginning. A form of life has meaning against the context of a world. Uh, becoming initiated in a form of, of life is to, uh, to have part of our world become part of the world of the person who is being taught. So that was the fourth, the fourth step and now the last one. Uh, closing the circle, the, the sentence was, the last one, a world has meaning against the context of a word. This is the toughest one for me, but I'll try to explain, explain it. Um, and here we will use some passages from the senses of Walden, that, uh, where Cavell presents his understanding of Thoreau's experiment at Walden. Um, as Cavell reminds us at the beginning of the census of Walden, that experiment, Thoreau's experiment, was all about inhabiting a world. It was about inhabiting a world in at least three related senses. All of them encapsulated in Thoreau's claim in chapter two that, I, I quote Thoreau, the present was my next experiment of this kind which I purpose to describe more at length in, in his book. So what is it that, that Thoreau goes on describing in his book? What is this, the, the present experiment? Well, first, um, he was recounting in his book the way he literally learned how to inhabit a portion of the world, a, a, a place and a time near Walden Pond, in particular building a house, building uh, his cabin. So this is the first literal meaning of Walden is an account of uh, the conditions that Thoreau had to satisfy to inhabit his world, that, that place. But also, and this is the second sense, which is, I think, much less remarked, but central for Cavell's reading of Walden, what Thoreau was describing was the experiment that was, that is, or was unfolding before our very eyes when we are reading his book. He's describing his experiment of writing Walden. So in this sense, he's also, since he is a writer, the author of the book, he is presenting the way he, as a writer, inhabited his world as a writer by writing Walden. So that was the second sense. And the last one is that, uh, equally uh, important, the idea of the present being an experiment also refers to, literally, the present moment. So as I, I think uh, it was part of what Thoreau is recounted, recounting his, in his book was, again, his task of rediscovering the conditions to live in the present instead of uh, keeping 
fixated in the past or in the future, as we so often do. This uh, rediscovery will involve a crisis and a kind of rebirth, which is encapsulated in the image of our mounting season. Molting or mounting? Molting season. Which, says Thoreau, like that of the fowls, must be a crisis in our lives. The loon retires to solitary ponds to spend it. Cavell, in, in commenting this, this passage about the molting season, uh, emphasizes that Thoreau says that we, that our crisis, that our molting season must be a crisis. This idea of must be. Cavell says the following. What the imperative means is that our molting, molting season, unlike that of the falls, is not a natural crisis. Nature does not manage it for us. So at the heart of this apparent return to nature, it is not haphazard for him, Thoreau, to say, and he quotes Thoreau, nature is hard to overcome, but she must be overcome. This is in book 11. Now, if I understand Cavell, this, in this passage, this overcoming of our nature is precisely what's involved when we go from a stage where language is still something merely natural to us, this would be what Thoreau calls our mother tongue, uh, the language that we get when we, with our mother's milk, I don't know if that's an idiom in English, in Portuguese we have something like that, uh, so, uh, th this uh, overcoming of nature has to do with going from this first stage where we learn language, as the child learns, as everybody learns, that was, des was described in the claim of reason, to another stage of mastery of language uh, that, Cavell, that Thoreau will call our father tongue, and Cavell will comment on this. Uh, so, here is here's a passage from the Census of Walden about this point. In loyalty to the mother tongue, which is part of our condition, the writer's words, Thoreau's words, must on the first level make literal or historical sense, present the brutest, the, the brutest of fact. It is that condition from which, if we are to hear significantly, we must be born again. A son, son of man is born of woman, but rebirth, according to our Bible, is the business of the father. So Walden's puns and paradoxes, its fracturing of idiom and twisting of quotation, its drones of fact and flights of impersonation, all are to keep faith at once with the mother and the father, to unite them and to have the word born in us. That's the end of the quotation. To have the word born in us, to achieve this new level of mastery in our language so that our sentences not only word the world as we were naturally and more or less mechanically taught to do, we need to assume full responsibility for our meaning, making our words convey our very way of inhabiting the world has to become personal in, in a very strict sense. Not necessarily private, but always risking privacy. Not something uh, risking the discovery that we are all alone in this way of inhabiting the world. Communities does not a given any longer, not something that we simply inherit with our mother tongue, but something to strive for continuously. And in fact, Thoreau continuously challenges the reader to become aware of this point, this distinction of two uses of language by his characteristic procedure, emphasized by Cavell, of insisting on the difference between, on the one hand, what we call something or what something is said to be and what things really are on the other hand. So Cavell reminds us in a passage that I will quote, what is called necessary is commonly a myth. 
what we call voluntary poverty may in fact be simplicity, independence, magnanimity, and trust. I will call your labor life for the sake of argument and so as not to raise too many questions at once. What you might call Christianity, if you, are, if you were accurate in its own criteria, does not exist or is not in any case what you do call Christianity. The point of modification is to suggest that our words are our, our calls or claims upon the objects and contexts of our world. They show how we count phenomena, what counts for us. The point is to get us to withhold a word, to hold ourselves before it, so that we may assess our allegiance to it, to the criteria in terms of which we apply it. Our faithful, uh, faithlessness to our language repeats our faithlessness to all our shared commitments. Uh, so this idea, as I understand, Cavell is reading Walden as embodying in, in its text this distinction between just using words more or less mechanically, more or less as we always did, as everybody does, just repeating words, and another kind of use in which we really assess our allegiance to our words. We re really assess the weight, what we are distinguishing how we are going to use it. And this, an example of this, or perhaps the main example of this in uh, Walden, the book, is uh, Thoreau's strategy of reappropriate, reappropriating economic terms to make them mean something new, something else, a reconceived human existence. Uh, Kelly was talking about this in his talk the other day. So I'm, I'm concluding here how I think this helps understanding the last step in that circle and closing the circle. So the, the sentence, the, the last sentence in the quote was, a world has meaning against the context of a word. The way I understand this is that words first acquire meaning. So in, in the first step, they first acquire meaning when we start using them in sentences, those sentences inside the language, the language inside a form of life, and that form of life is a way of expressing the world, the world that we share. So th that's the first stage, so to speak, of acquiring language. And, and meaning, our words meaning uh, express this, uh, this process. Every master of language, every adult, has to go through this process of learning to become part of our community, our form, form of life, our world. But then there is another step which only a few of us will take that consists in taking full responsibility for our way of inhabiting the world, hence for our way of wording the world. And that will re involve a renewed use of our inherited words, which in turn will open up a way of giving full meaning to our worlds. And that's basically it. That's the way I think the circle closes and we are back again to a world, a word uh, presenting the context where a world will make sense. That was it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what, I think what I'll do is start maybe by talking a little bit about what you've said. Uh, I don't think I have anything that I want to quarrel with, but I thought perhaps I could say a little bit more about some of the themes. So let me start with the structure of that quotation from the senses of Walden that you're focused on. As you mentioned, of course, what Cavell's starting with there is a near quotation of Frege. And it's worth remembering that the context principle, which is the principle of Frege's that's being nearly quoted there, right, is itself embedded in three principles at the beginning of the foundations of arithmetic. So the first principle roughly goes uh, uh, you know, always uh, to separate the psychological from the logical, the, object, the subjective from the objective, 
Then the second principle is never ask for the meaning of a word except in the context of a proposition. That's the one that's almost quoted. And then the last is uh, always sharply, uh, never to lose sight of the distinction between concept and object. And it's, I think, a very useful way of thinking about Wittgenstein in his work to think about him as, in a sense, obsessed with those three principles and how to understand them as he moves from the beginning of his authorship really until its end, because I think he's still meditating on those principles even in, say, on certainty in crucial ways. Now, I'm not gonna try to talk about exactly how things work in that story. I've tried to tell that story in other places, but I'll just say this. One way of thinking about the state of Wittgenstein's thinking about those principles in the investigations is to restate those principles or something very much like them in, in the terminology of the investigations itself. And so you might say, well, look, the first of these three principles in the investigations would be something like uh, always to separate the psychological from the logical, the private from the public, right? The second would be uh, never to ask for the meaning of a word or a sentence except in the context of a language game. And the third would be something like, you know, never to lose sight of the distinction between concept and object, but since those terms as such don't seem to appear in PI in quite their Phrygian register, I think maybe a better way of putting it, though it can be kind of confusing at first, is to think about that third principle as something like this, never to lose sight of the distinction between conceptual investigation and empirical investigation. Those are the sort of three conceptual successors to Frege's principles that I think, in a sense, undergird PI. They're there in PI. And I think Cavell has a very lively sense of those things, and he's you know, bringing that sense of them to bear, not only in his reading of Wittgenstein, but also in his reading of Thoreau, as we see you know, in the passage that you were thinking about. And you're also right that part of what's puzzling, now moving over to Cavell's passage again, part of what's puzzling about the way that Cavell does this is that he doesn't stop with form of life, Right, but goes on and says, but then there's the world, and then of course we get that curling back on ourselves, and we get back to the word. Uh, and one thing that I take it Cavell's clearly trying to do in that passage is not to endorse, but rather to provoke worry about linguistic idealism. Right? A worry that I take it dogs your steps if you're serious about Wittgenstein uh, and if you're serious about Thoreau um, in the way that Cavell is serious about Thoreau. And so he's trying to provoke a certain kind of concern with linguistic idealism, this idea that the words are just going to swallow the word, uh, the world rather, right? Um, because he wants to engage with that sense that we have that that could happen, that that's so much as a possibility, that words could, as it were, yawn wide enough to swallow the world. Um, and so he's worried, worried about our sense of that and worried about how the text of Walden can you know, incite that sense in you, make you worry about it, and you know, to the extent to which Walden can respond to that worry, quiet that worry, even after it's you know, provoked it in you. Um, now, another way of thinking about the difficulty of the passage in Cavell is to think about um, a passage, I wish I could quote it from memory, but I can't, but there's this remarkable paragraph in Terence Malick's introduction to Heidegger's The Essence of Reasons where he's talking about Wittgenstein's use of form of life and Heidegger's use of word. You may recall the passage. But that passage, I think, is really useful in thinking about what you're worried about because, in effect, what Malik says in that passage is that you know, for Wittgenstein, the notion of form of life is sort of liminal, right? Uh, in a, I think the way, and he thinks the same thing is true, though, again, perhaps in a slightly different way, of world for Heidegger. And he says, you know, each of them uses these notions to mark a point at which a certain problem is, as it were, moving out of their jurisdiction. I think that is the word Malik uses. And so again, you know, that helps you to, to see what's provocative about the passage that Cavell has written. Because you could say, yeah, we've gotten to the liminal stage and we've gone crashing past it. You know, past form of life to world, all the way back to word again. Uh, and so I think the passage is, in a way, a, a very puzzling and troubling passage. Uh, but I think that Cavell's right to want to insist on 
this sort of thing when talking about Thoreau. And so let me now try to say a little bit about how, how all of this might be reg, you know, sort of registered in the text of Walden. I mean, one of the things that I think is really striking about Walden, just as an act of writing, is how remarkably cross-referential its terms are, so that you know, when you're reading a passage in Walden, you're never going to be able to understand that passage, and here I'm just using spatial metaphors as a way of helping my self make the point easily. You're never gonna be able to understand the passage by just as it were trying to stare through the words to the world, in part because Thoreau is never using the words in quite the way you expect him to use them. You know, there's a way in which every word in Walden, perhaps that's an, you know, an exaggeration, but something like that seems right to me. Every word in Walden gets problematized, and this, of course, becomes explicit in all of this language about what, what the folks in Concord call this, what we call that, and I'll try to say a little bit more about that in a minute. So, so you, know, you have this temptation to think, yeah, I can just sort of stare through the words to the world. I can see what Thoreau's on about. But of course, that's really not right, because to really understand what he's talking about, you've got to see that sentence in its relationship with everything else ahead of it and after it in the book. It's going to be the case that the words in the sentence have all kinds of strange cross-references to other, I'm calling them that just to get a sense here of what you might think of as reference that runs horizontal, runs across the pages instead of from the page to the world. There's all these ways in which the words are bound up with each other. And I can't really, as it were, see what Thoreau's talking about until I understand the full complexity of his way of talking about it. So that I have to keep, you know, as it were, my finger on the sentence I'm on while scanning back and in a way, though of course I haven't gotten there yet, scanning forward to see what's really going to happen with this word right, in the way that Thoreau wants to use it. And I think what, what Thoreau wants to be able to do in writing in that way, at least in part, is that he wants, and these are the passages from Cavell I think you were quite rightly bringing in to help elucidate uh, what Cavell's thinking about. What he wants, of course, is to really wake us up to the fact that we stand in a relationship to our words. Right? I think it's incredibly easy to forget that the most natural thing is to think about the relationship between the word and the world, and to think that your relationship to the word has nothing to do with that relationship. Right? That relationship somehow takes care of itself. There's something about the word that just does the work right, of getting it attached to the world. And I think what you know, Thoreau is constantly trying to do is to get you to see that that can't be right exactly. You're responsible for the word. You're using the word in a certain way, and being thus responsible or using it thusly, you, you, know, you are now talking in a particular way about a particular thing. But the word doesn't, as it were, bear all the responsibility for that. It's not doing it on its own accord. You're involved, right? And so there's this way in which, sort of reminiscent of the way that Kierkegaard's constantly trying to call us back to what he calls the how, and not just to the what. Right? The what is sort of our idea about the relationship of the word to the world, but the how is something like my relationship with, to the word, what, I, what I'm doing with it, my, the responsibility I bear, I bear for the word. And I think Thoreau's constantly trying to get you to worry about that. What do people call things? Why are you using this word? Uh, don't you recognize that I've punned here? Don't you see that the entire sentence have, have, this entire sentence has an amphibolous structure? What am I doing with the words I'm putting on the page? Why are, you, why are you spending your time with them? I don't think he wants to ever let you out of those sorts of worries. Um, that's, what he, you know, that's what he's up to. And so there is, you know, in a very important sense, a way in which the, the text of Thoreau is sort of as deeply contextual as about any text you'll run into. The words are always said against the other words. And of course, there's gotta be some sense in which they're also said against the world, you know, in which Walden, the book, is said against Walden, the place, as you, were, as you were saying. But I think that the idea is that's got to be true, but the way that that relationship works is something that Thoreau is himself responsible for and that you as the reader are in certain ways responsible for. At the very least, you're responsible for taking up the words that Thoreau has made his responsibility. You can't, you can't pawn off the responsibility on just him either. You've got, to, you've got to read the book, you've got to do something with it. And so I think what, 
what Thoreau wants to do, and I think this is part of why, I mean, this is not a full explanation, but I think it's part of why Cavell circles back to the word at the end, is because he wants you to, again, realize that there's no way of telling the story on which you get to a point where finally you're not involved, where your responsibility is somehow, you've been absolved of responsibility and now things are just taken care of, right? Oh, at long last, I've come up against, you know, the final uh, uh, background, right? The last thing against which, you know, this can be seen. I mean, in a way you could hear what Thoreau, Cavell's doing in the structure of that passage against those, those images about rule following in the blue book where I've got arrows behind arrows behind arrows. And you know, the idea is, yeah, but there's not one arrow that's the magic arrow that suddenly does the interpreting for itself. You know, I'm always responsible. And so I don't think the point is, and here I, I don't have time to develop this as much as I might like, but I don't think the point is, so to speak, linguistic idealism. It's linguistic responsibility. That's what the real issue is. Making sure that you are, to use a phrase of Wendell Berry's, standing by your words. There's a great essay of Wendell Berry's in a collection of his essays with that title. Um, you know, where standing by your words, of course, can be a whole host of different kinds of relationships, depending on what's happening and who you're talking to and so on, but it's ineliminable. There's always that question. Are you standing by your words and how are you standing by them? And that, I'll sort of let that go in terms of commenting on what you were saying, but that takes me to this passage the, uh, from Sentences on page 53. Um, let me read the passage to you because I think it's connected to what we've been talking about. Um, the fate of having a self, this is a quotation, the fate of having a self, of being human, is one in which the self is always to be found, fated to be sought or not, recognized or not. My self is something apparently toward which I can stand in various relations, ones in which I can stand to other selves, named by the same terms. For example, love, hate, disgust, acceptance, knowledge, ignorance, faith, pride, shame. And I think what's interesting you know, about that passage is that you get an image there of, as it were, not standing by your words, but of standing by yourself. That there's a way in which you bear a responsibility for that relationship all the time too. You're, you're in some relationship to yourself all the time. And that's something that you need to be aware of. It's fate, uh, to use the, the word there. It's the beginning of that section. So that again, my having a self isn't something that I can just sort of trust the world to take care of for me. Uh, there's always this question of how I'm related to me, of whether I you know, hate myself, love myself, am ignorant of myself, have knowledge of myself, uh, and so on. Um, and that passage, I think, uh, connects up nicely with the passage also from the sentences section, now pages 63 and 4. Uh, let me read this passage to you. I'll say a little bit about it and, and then maybe just a word or two about one more and I'll be done. But in this passage, which runs this way, in religion and politics, literality is defeated because we allow our choices to be made for us. In religion, our hymn books resound with a cursing of God because the words are used in vain. We are given to say that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, but we do not let the words assess our lives. We do not mean what they could mean, so what we do when we repeat those words becomes the whole meaning of man and chief end and glorify and God, etc., in our lives. And that's a curse. In politics, we allow ourselves to say, for example, that a man is a fugitive who's merely running from enslavement. That's an attempted choice of meaning, not an autonomous choice of words. Now, I'm not going to try to say something about everything in that passage, but I think it's worth seeing that that passage is a nice illustration of, again, this idea of you're constantly being asked by Walden to assess your relationship to your words. And here are the ideas in, you know, for the, take the religious context. In the religious context, we constantly want to think that the words can somehow just take care of themselves. And we don't, we certainly don't want it to be the case that there's some sense in which, you know, the words can stand in judgment on us. Now, that's a complicated business, how they would do that, but I think what, you know, Cavell's gesturing at and what I think he rightly finds in Walden is this, you know, worry about the tendency of religious language to become purely formulaic and empty. Uh, for us to think that you know, the mere fact that I'm saying these words at a certain hour, on a certain day of the week, in a certain place, 
guarantees that I'm doing something with them of the sort that I ought to be doing. And there's no reason to think that's true at all. There's no reason to think that anything I'm doing uh, in those moments is anything but profane, uh, or anything but, if you want a kind of Kierkegaardian term, something secular, um, that I'm really not using the words in any particularly religious way at all. Um, because I'm not worried, as I should be worried, about my relationship to those words and about what kind of responsibility I bear for using them. I mean, I think it's striking that in one of the passages you quoted, Cavell talks about, you know, well, there won't be cities and mayors in her world, right? And then at the end of the passage, it says, in the way there's not God and love and, you know, and so on in ours. And again, I think part of what he's trying to get, get you to see there is that those are words, the use of which, you know, requires a tremendous sort of taking on of responsibility by you for them. You don't just get to use them. You know, you've got to be doing something with them, and that's not an easy thing to do. Taking responsibility for such words is a, a daunting prospect. Uh, uh, love, beauty, God, uh, those are words that we, we all too often don't want to relate to in a way that would allow them to sort of assess our lives. Right? We think of them as something that we can house comfortably in our lives as we, as we live them. You know, we know what beauty is because we go to Ikea or something. Right? Uh, or we know what truth is because we read the newspaper. Um, and that's, I think, the kind of mistake that Thoreau's constantly pushing against. And again, I think it's related to these broad issues that you've, you've brought up. Um, there's one other passage I wanted to mention something about, if I can find it here real quick. Um, yeah, it's the passage from Portions, page 75. Uh, this is a different, different sort of issue. And here I really just wanted to bring up a couple of things to use as objects of comparison to the passage. So the passage from Portions, it's again page 75 in the uh, Senses of Walden, runs like this. The human imagination is released by fact. Alone, left to its own devices, it will not recover reality it will not form an edge. So a favorite trust of the romantics has, along with what we know of experience, to be brought under instruction. The one kept from straining, the other from stifling itself to death. Both imagination and experience continue to require what the Renaissance had in mind, vis-a-vis -vis, that they be humanized. Now, a couple of things to set alongside that passage that I think are useful. And the first two are specifically philosophical. One is a passage in Austin, where Austin talks about the fact, J.L. Austin talks about the fact that, as he puts it, philosophers need to discipline their wretched imaginations, right? I mean, I think that's a really striking complaint about philosophers, because I think for many philosophers, one of the things they take to be sort of the glory of their business is their sort of very active, very disciplined imaginations thought experiments and counterexamples and all the things that are you know, the furniture of conferences uh, when philosophers gather together. Uh, but Austin thinks, no, look, the, these imag the imagination of philosophers too often are just are wretched because they're undisciplined. And I think this idea that you know, um, the imagination is released by fact, but left to its own devices and won't recover reality is Cavell worrying about something very similar to what Austin is worried about? The fact that it's, t it's very easy in philosophical context to allow your imagination to just run wild with you uh, in a way that's not disciplined, not uh, uh, forming an edge, to use the, the phrase that Cavell uses here. And then there's one other, again, philosopher's passage that I want to mention here. It's not so much a passage as it is a repeated uh, distinction. In the, in the work of Virgil Aldridge, there's this very interesting idea. Aldridge makes a distinction between two kinds of philosophers. Uh, one group he calls workers in philosophy, and the others he calls funsters in philosophy. And he says the workers are, in effect, those who have what Austin would regard as a disciplined imagination, who, for instance, are constantly asking themselves whether the things that they're imagining stand in the right kinds of relationships to the words they're using. You know, am I really imagining what I take myself to imagine? Can I make sense of this? Am I just imagining that I'm using these words? You know, is there some kind of constraint on what I'm doing? Whereas the funsters, he thinks, take themselves to be constrained by nothing except logical contradiction. 
Right? That's the only real constraint on the use of the imagination. Um, and there's a lot, to, you know, a lot to be said about that distinction in Aldrich and about exactly, you know, there are questions about exactly how, how clear he makes it. But I think it's, you know, again, related to this passage in the sense that you can see this passage is sort of calling you back from funsterism to being a worker uh, and to saying, look, you know, the imagination needs to be disciplined in certain ways. Uh, we can't let it run riot uh, with us. And last thought about the passage, and this is just... Um, Call this philosophy if you want, call it uh, non-philosophy if you want, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's not someone that we normally think of as a philosopher, but you know, there's this wonderful idea in Samuel Johnson that he calls the hunger of the imagination. Um, there's a brilliant dis discussion of that idea in Walter Jackson Bates' book, uh, The Achievement of Samuel Johnson. And what Bate takes to be going on here is, you know, connected to Johnson's worries, too, about the vanity of human wishes, you know, the title of Johnson's famous, one of Johnson's famous poems. But the idea that the imagination is hungry, that it, that it will consume us in certain ways, that we need to keep it under a certain kind of control, uh, is, I think, uh, again, a really important kind of, of general admonition to us, but maybe particularly important in philosophy, you know, what exactly that comes to, you know, what exactly we should make of the Aldrich distinction, exactly how we discipline the imagination. I haven't said much about any of that, but I just wanted to mention those passages as things you might use in relationship to this passage uh, in trying to think more about it and about the idea of the imagination being brought under instruction. Thank you. Uh uh, Jen Otis and, and Kelly. Um, you know, it's interesting, the passage that you chose uh, is one I remember I quoted it in an article that I wrote maybe 30 or 35 years ago uh, called Self and World in Walden. Uh, and uh, I think I had the idea correct uh, as you have explicated it. Um, and the idea, in a sense, that, that the whole history of the empiricist tradition uh, is more or less encapsulated in that along with the critique. Uh, uh, but uh, but it was, it was uh, useful, and your remarks were very useful. Um, I'm, uh, I'm chagrined, I have to say, to have read this quote. I'm convinced that this is of Cavell and it's from Portions, page 95. I'm convinced that Cavell had the Kantian idea right, that the objects of our knowledge require a transcendental, or we may say grammatical or phenomenological preparation, that we know just what meets the a priori conditions of our knowing anything, überhaupt. These a priori conditions are necessities of human nature, and the search for them is something I think Thoreau's obsession with necessity is meant to declare. His difference from Kant on this point is that these a priori conditions are not themselves knowable a priori, but are to be discovered experimentally. Historically, Hegel has said, you know, I don't know if that was in the back of my mind or not. When I wrote the paper where I was making that big argument about transcendental uh, and uh, identified uh, Thoreau's version of transcendentalism as Hegelian. But in any case, <laughs> um, I thought I would just talk a little bit about uh, the, a couple of the passages that are, are kind of historical and about American culture um, that, uh, that are on this list uh, and, and try and say something about them. Uh, I'm, So the very first thing that, that uh, a passage here from Words, page 33, uh, Cavell's, uh, Cavell's words are, study of Walden would perhaps not have become such an obsession with me had it not presented itself as a response to questions with which I was already obsessed. Why has America never expressed itself philosophically? 
or has it in the metaphysical riot of its greatest literature? Has the impulse to philosophical speculation been absorbed or exhausted by speculation in territory, as in such thoughts as manifest destiny, or are such questions not really intelligible? They are at any rate disturbingly like the questions that were asked about Amer American literature before it established itself. And I think that, uh, that this is, is indeed a, a kind of a preoccupation of Cavell's. Um, he has said in other places that he wanted to take himself back to an era before the traditions had divided as completely as they, uh, as they uh, tended to. And indeed, I think he was one of the figures, uh, there were others too, but one of the figures in the, in the 70s and 80s who was among the first of people who had come out of the analytical tradition uh, to br bring the continental tradition in a serious way in. Um, when he uh, uh, started uh, uh, teaching courses in which he read Heidegger and, and uh, talked about it, that was, uh, that was a, 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 a new phenomenon. There were others, uh, and uh, a fair number of others actually, but, but I think he was among the very first uh, who did that. He, he was also obsessed in a way with America um, and Thoreau, therefore, I think, presented a kind of uh, choosable ancestor uh, for him, that he was, uh, of course, uh, constantly aware, Cavell, that is to say, that he was uh, uh, the son of, of Jewish immigrants. Um, and... Uh, the stories that he tells uh, early on of the way he chose his own name uh, is, uh, is an interesting uh, one. Uh, the fact that he had heard something like some version of Cavell as Cavalieri or something like that, uh, and the, the family name given to, by the uh, the, the immigration agent uh, at Ellis Island to his arriving uh, uh, parent was, was Goldstein. So, so he, he, he renamed himself and did it by deed poll when he was 16. But he, but he on the one hand, he, he had this deep concern with American culture. And on the other hand, he had the, the kind of immigrants uh, and a whole generation of Jewish intellectuals had this, this immigrant's uh, uh, sort of uh, not uneasy but, but slightly uh, a, a slant uh, relationship to it. Um, but that, the, that, I, that I think is, is a particularly interesting thing for Cavell, it, perhaps not for Thoreau because uh, Thoreau is, is going to be uh, in, enlisted and then the, 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 a writer in meditation is literally a human being awaiting expression. The writer in Walden assumes a larger burden of this waiting than other men uh, may, partly because it is, it is his subject that the word and the reader can only be awakened together, partly because as once before, there is an unprecedented din of prophecy in the world. Everyone is saying, and anyone can hear, that this is the new world, we are the new men, the earth is to be born again, the past is to be cast off like a skin, we must learn from children to see again, every day is the first day of the world, America is Eden. So how can a word get through whose burden is that we do not understand a word of all this? Or rather, the way in which we understand it is insane and that we are trying again to buy or bully our way into heaven, that we have failed, that the present is a task and a discovery, not a period of America's privileged history, that we are not free, not whole, not new, and that we know this and are on a downward path of despair because of it, and that for the child to grow, uh, he requires family and familiarity, but for a grown-up to grow, 
he requires strangeness and transformation, i.e. birth, uh, or possibly rebirth. Um, and that does speak to the cultural moment uh, in the United States in the 1850s, roughly. Uh, it's a, uh, the famous book by uh, uh, Lewis, I guess it is, called The American Adam. Uh, and that was the figure that was, was constantly being invoked, that here's this new world and we've been given it and you know, let's throw off all the stuff from the past and go on. And it is interesting that Thoreau's whole project of going to Walden, which as he says, began uh, by chance on the 4th of July, uh, that it involves a kind of uh, the, the, the notion that Cavell has of founding. Um, in this case, kind of refounding. And I talked a little bit about uh, last night about the historical uh, situation in the United States at the time that, that Thoreau wrote. Uh, and there's a reference later on, the, the idea of the fugitive slave, for example. Uh, the words that are, are uh, betray, <laughs> betray us. Uh, the idea that, that Cavell's sort of interpretation of that is that Th that the whole, no, it isn't just that Thoreau is, is uh, going to undertake a project of discovering the necessaries of human life. That's one of the things that he does say that he's doing. It isn't just that uh, he's, you know, sort of going to tell the story uh, in this carefully structured way so that he converts his two years of living there to a year uh, he structures it around the seasons. Uh, he, uh, it runs from summer uh, through, through fall, winter, and then spring, <coughs> so that he, evo he, he evokes the traditional literary uh, cycle of comedy. Uh, but that he's also a fully aware that everything he's writing is a critique of contemporary America. Everything that he's saying is a critique. Uh, and a critique even, presumably, of some of the people that he respects and admires. Uh, so that it, the whole, this whole project of, of Walden, of working on Walden, uh, was, if Cavell's uh, interpretation is right, was to, as it were, do this refounding. So it's a it's a partly a political refounding. That is, the question is, how how are we to live? How how are we going to live together? We're, you know, and there's isolation. There's neighbors. There's there's the relationship between them, and so on. There's all of that, but it's also something like everything has gone wrong. You know, here we here we are in in this country, which is now claiming to be you know wonderful and and uh, uh, grand and and uh, so on. The, you know, visitors like uh, Trollope and <laughs> and his mother uh, think think it's ridiculous and horrible and so on. But they but they portray the Americans as as uh, these these uh, sort of almost savage, uh, money-seeking uh, uh, people. Thoreau has this, this delicate, in a sense, critique of the whole idea of, 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 of America as, and this is where I was comparing him to Marx, but of, of the whole, of this whole system of, of division of labor in a sense, uh, he's like Marx, he takes that to be kind of the original sin. Uh, and he wants to, to somehow try and show a way of life, not 
in detail. He's not saying everybody should go build a cabin in the woods. He, he specifically says he doesn't mean that, but that everyone should somehow try and move towards what you were talking about, the responsibility, taking responsibility uh, for, for uh, one's words and one's actions. So it's, it's uh, Cavell's description here, therefore, the, the way we understand this is insane and we're trying to buy and bully our way into heaven that we have failed, that the present is a task and a discovery, not a period of America's privileged history, that we are not free, not whole, not new, and that we know this and are on a downward path of despair uh, because of it, and that for the child to grow his family, he requires family and familiarity, but for a grown-up to grow, he requires strangeness and transformation, uh, i.e. birth. That's actually a question, <laughs> uh, so, that, so that it concludes with a question mark. Um, so that's the the uh, uh, the 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 interpretation in a sense of of uh, Walden that comes through here uh, is I think both of you have have uh, usefully and uh, in with good expression. Uh, uh, identified that that it is about what a, what a kind of correct understanding uh, of language and the world involves. This is why uh, I, it seems to me uh, unquestionable that this is a work uh, of philosophy. Uh, and that it it and and, and the, that it's part of the symptomology that Thoreau describes of his own era that it wasn't really perceived as such. Uh, you talked about it being misread, and I, I think it was misread because of the, that it was right in this analysis. Uh, that, that it was uh, uh, thought to somehow be, uh, you know, it's about nature and it's about uh, the pond animals and it's, it's about uh, planting a bunch of beans and what it's like to, you know, you hear the train and the woods. I mean, all, it's about all those things. It's, it's got all that stuff in it, but it's about this, this utterly crucial uh, feature of somehow trying to come to understand. When we talk about philosophy as a way of life, uh, he clearly describes uh, that he thinks that philosophy is a, the way of life uh, that, that is, is crucially important. It's, the, it's what human beings are capable of but are not actually doing. Uh, they're settling for sort of average everydayness, uh, and <laughs> that's not uh, that's not good enough. Uh, so, uh, I thank I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Eduardo for for uh, putting these these quotations in front of us because it does remind me now, and uh, I, I kind of needed the reminding of how uh, interesting the book is, how the census of Walden, not just Walden is interesting, obviously, but the census of Walden and how important it is uh, because it, it brought Thoreau back into this conversation. Uh, so you may not uh, agree with every sentence of, of uh, <laughs> what Cavell has to say about it, uh, but it does, I think he had the book categorized correctly uh, and in doing that, he actually expanded uh, kind of amazingly, uh, as he did in many other areas, by the way, um, the curriculum of philosophy departments. Uh, it, you know, there's, there, I can't think of another person, not Rorty, not, not really anybody who brought movies, Shakespeare, opera, uh, 
all of these all of these topics back into the uh, into a philosophy curriculum. Um, but anyway, that's that's my piece. <laughs>